Hey everybody, one last time, I want to remind you to stay till the end of the video to catch a trailer for the next Kill Count, which will actually be out on Sunday. You're getting two this week. All right, enjoy the show. Welcome to the Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we've got our first official Kill Count reboot, because I'm doing Night of the Living Dead all over again, from the ground up just like it's undead ghouls. When I first covered this movie back in 2017, the Kill Count was a different show, with way less information and much worse audio processing. Everything from The Walking Dead to World War Z can be traced back to this little indie film. I don't think it's fair that the movies covered on those early Kill Counts get the short end of the stick in terms of production quality and behind the scenes info. That's why I'll be redoing some of them going forward. Night of the Living Dead right now, and starting in August, the entire series that started the channel, Friday the 13th. As important as Friday was to the genre and my channel though, there's no worthier candidate for the Kill Count's first ever second look than Night of the Living Dead. Released in 1968 by director George A. Romero, who was also the co-writer, editor, and cinematographer, this independent zombie movie changed everything about the horror genre. I'd argue just as much as Psycho did eight years earlier. Yeah, a psycho popularized a man killing other people in violent ways, but Night of the Living Dead was a truly horrific experience, way more graphic and realistic than what most audience members were used to seeing. Before this, horror movies were gothic or schlocky, a reasonable matinee that you could send your kids to. Screenings of Night of the Living Dead left unattended children in tears, and it was one of the movies frequently cited as leading to the creation of the MPAA. Looking back, it's no surprise that this grim film came came out when it did, as American audiences were living in one of the most turbulent years in modern history. The historical influences on and impacts of this movie were immense, but the kill count isn't the best place to discuss them, which is why you should check out our podcast episode, Zombies in America's Nightmares, where Chelsea and I discuss those ideas in depth. What I can say in this kill count is that you can thank this movie for the modern zombie. Before this, zombies were the stuff of Haitian folklore, brainwashed ghouls who were controlled by voodoo. It was Night of the Living Dead that made them flesh-eating, reanimated corpses. In fact, Romero didn't even think of them as zombies when he made the movie. And I thought I was doing a, a new creature. Regardless of what they were called, Romero wrote the monsters as a metaphor for society's collapse and the disintegration of the family unit. The symbolism of the undead would grow even more apparent in his first two sequels, the shopping mall set Dawn of the Dead and the militaristic Day of the Dead. I'll be covering both of those in the next couple of weeks, but after that, I'll be moving on to other stuff. I know that Romero made three more sequels in the mid to late 2000s, that all three films of the original trilogy have been remade, and that Return of the Living Dead and its four sequels could also be considered a sort of spin-off series from this film. I have seen the flowchart image. I know. I know. But I can't just drown in zombies for months straight, y'all. We're gonna have to get piecemeal up in this bitch. So we're starting here today with the OG, the Coca-Cola classic, the grandfather of The Walking Dead. Of course, Night of the Living Dead didn't only inspire zombie movies and TV shows. It also inspired zombie books, which you could listen to using today's sponsor, Audible. Audible offers thousands of audiobooks and podcasts through their popular Plus catalog including titles like Pride and Prejudice and Zombies and World War Z, which I absolutely love. They also have I Am Legend, which was a huge inspiration for Romero when he made this movie. He just swapped out vampires for undead ghouls and rewound the apocalypse back to the beginning. I've used Audible to reread the Lord of the Rings trilogy, and Chelsea uses it to learn about the Tudor dynasty, like the queen that she is. You can get a 30-day free trial of Audible's catalog by visiting audible.com slash deadmeat, or texting deadmeat to the number 500-500. That's audible.com slash deadmeat, or text dead meat to 500 500 to try Audible today. Thanks, Audible. To make things interesting, my dumbass has decided to count zombie deaths. Let's see if that decision drives me insane and get to the kills. The movie begins with a car driving around the bend into a title card, making it a title card. Right away, the mood is eerie, and not just because of the splattered with something cemetery sign. The score blaring on the soundtrack is unabashedly unsettling. <laughs> The 
music in this movie wasn't an original composition. It was essentially stock music, already 10 years old, and had previously been used in the sci-fi flick Teenagers from Outer Space. Night of the Living Dead was the ultimate indie film. With a budget of only $117,000, Romero and his small crew did everything themselves, using the experience they gained making local commercials under their small production company, The Latent Image. The only thing none of them knew how to do was make music, which is why Romero used pre-existing tracks from the Q library. Siblings Barbara and Johnny are here to pay respects to their deceased father, or their disrespects, as the case may be. I don't even remember what the man looks like. Johnny, it takes you five minutes. Yeah, five minutes to put the wreath on the grave and six hours to drive back and forth. Johnny's played by Russell Striner, one of the film's producers. Most of the crew would end up on screen in order to save money. Barbara is played by Judith O'Day, who was a standout convention meet when I talked to her in 2018. Absolutely delightful woman. While at the grave, Johnny sees a man in a suit sauntering around. In true sibling fashion, he uses it to tease Barb. They're coming to get you, Barbara. Stop it! You're ignorant! Suited cemetery guy ain't just teasing though, and he grabs at Barbara with his Herman Munster face. Johnny tries to help his sister out, but as she watches in horror, he gets brained against a gravestone on the ground. Fucking ouch! As the storm begins to open up, the ghoul chases Barbara through the cemetery and into her car, where he uses a brick to try to force his way in. He may not have strength, but he does have persistence, and his use of a tool pays off. What a brainy brain eater. My zombies have never eaten brains. They're, they're this misconception. Yeah, you're right, George. That's more of a return of the living dead thing. Brains. Sorry for that to the numbers gag I did in the original kill count. Brains. Barb escapes in neutral and wrecks her ride against a tree, then flees on foot until she finds a farmhouse. Quick, Barb, that stock chase music is wilding the fuck out. Get inside and shut it up. Yeah, there you go. This farmhouse setting was another way Knight modernized the horror genre. It's symbolic, in fact, that the movie starts off in a graveyard, hearkening back to the gothic style of Universal monster flicks, before relocating to a much more domestic and modern place. Sadly, the farmhouse itself was demolished some time ago, but the cemetery still stands where the movie was filmed. Evans City, Pennsylvania, about 30 miles north of Pittsburgh, which is where Romero went to college. Go Panthers! Barb arms herself with a knife and examines her newly found fortress. Whoever lived here loved taxidermy, but hated paying their phone bills. Oh, and also, they are dead. Barb finds a scully face at the top of the stairs, and though it's half a scully, fuck it. Let's count this corpse for fun. With the cemetery zombie inviting his bros over for a hangout, it only makes sense for Barb to get a house guest too. Enter badass Ben, played by the marvelous Dwayne Jones. He's ready to take control of this situation and the entire movie. Good timing, too, since Barbara's been shocked into utter uselessness. Like, what are you even doing right now, Barb? Feeling on that wall. Do the snozberries taste like snozberries? Ben sees a couple of zombies trashing his truck, so he goes out there to beat some ass with a tire iron. Like I said, this time through, I've decided to count zombies, though I do reserve the right to call it off if any of the sequels get too wild. Zombie movies always killing like thousands of zombies, man. It's not fun to count. Another zombie, played by co-writer John A. Russo, enters the farmhouse and comes to get Barbara. Ben returns in time to save her and get another kill by stabbing the zombie in the forehead with his tire iron. Nice kill, dude. Don't look at it. What, not even to compliment your work? Okay. Ben lights up the body to keep the approaching Zeds away, then gets to work finding tools to make this place safe. While he's at it, he gives Barbara an empathetic pep talk. Look, I know you're afraid. I'm afraid too. That's enough to get her to help, and the two of them tear the place apart and board it up until it's looking like a Call of Duty zombies map. Appropriately, Ben then finds a rifle in the closet. A Winchester 1894, according to the Internet Movie Firearms Database. Ben and Barb exchange stories about what led them to this farmhouse, giving Dwayne Jones the chance to show off his training as a theater actor. I, I started to drive. I just plowed right through them. They didn't move, they didn't run, or just stood there staring at me. Barbara's story is a bit less dramatic. And he said, can I have some candy, Barbara? 
Um, we didn't have any. The tail of the candy that wasn't there upsets Barbara so much, she tries to run outside. In the ensuing dispute, Ben hits her, like, pretty hard, dude, damn. And she faints, relegating her to the couch for a while. Ben listens to radio reports about what's happening outside, but the information is incomplete. Remember, this movie created the undead zombie, so the characters in it wouldn't have any idea what was happening. There is an epidemic of mass murder being committed by a virtual army of unidentified assassins. As far as they know, these are hordes of senseless assassins walking around in a trance. Which is nothing a little sofa fire couldn't fix, am I right? Get out of here, zombies! Just go on and get! Ben fixes up Barbara's feed and tells her he's got this place pretty damn safe. Might as well start tidying up inside. Hey, that's way more of a face than we saw before. That corpse used to be missing all its skin from its skull, and the radio reveals why that is. Medical examination of victims' bodies shows conclusively that the killers are eating the flesh of the people they kill. All of a sudden, two dudes come out of the cellar, and they're really good at identifying objects. A radio! Harry Cooper here finds himself on Ben's shit list right away, since he's been downstairs this whole time, but never bothered coming up to help. We luck into a safe place, and you're telling us we gotta risk our lives just because somebody might need help, huh? Yeah, something like that. With the introduction of Harry Cooper, we get the moral conflicts that make zombie media so interesting. The fact that he's a white man, visibly bristled by Ben's leadership, also gives us cultural commentary that would have been extra salient in 68, in the midst of the civil rights era. Brief tangent about that. Romero said repeatedly that he didn't write his script with a racial message in mind. Ben was written as a white man, but since Dwayne Jones gave the best audition, Romero cast him in a sort of colorblind way. They were going after the guy when he was white. And, and uh, so I, that was not our point. Regardless of Romero's intent, though, the racial implications were impossible to ignore. Romero admitted as much after critics and viewers called attention to it. I mean, America was still segregated to some extent in the South, and some theaters down in the States and in the drive-ins wouldn't book this they because book of the, just because of the, the color of the hero's skin. Yes, that's right, that's right. Of course, Dwayne Jones was aware of the subtext all along. As a black man, he didn't have the option to ignore the matter. That was made painfully obvious when he was driving home from set one night and was followed by a truck full of racist teens brandishing a tire iron at him. There was a moment when we were truly um, in real danger. We never stopped to fully acknowledge it. Harry argues that everyone should move down to the cellar, since it's only one door that they would need to defend. But All-American Teenager Tom points out there'd be no escaping if the attackers broke through. Plus, another benefit of being upstairs is windows. We got windows to see what's going on outside. But down there with no windows. Gotta have windows, Harry. Then again, windows can be dangerous. Quit trying to get in through the windows, you ghoul. And do something about those putty hands. Jesus. The home invader takes a couple of shots from the Winchester, but isn't killed until he's hit a third time with a well-aimed headshot. As night falls, dozens of zombies show up. Some of them are naked, some of them have skin lesions, and some of them, ironically, are into that survivalist lifestyle. Gotta get that protein in. All of these ghouls were played by locals of Evan City, who were just excited to be in a movie, with no idea how impactful it would be. Ben and Harry continue to argue over where they should be and who in charge. You can be the boss down there. I'm boss up here. As the characters shuffle around, we meet the final few survivors in the farmhouse. Tom's girlfriend Judy, Harry's wife Helen, and the Coopers' young daughter Karen, unconscious after being attacked by a ghoul. Helen Cooper is played by Marilyn Eastman, who I've always found completely gorgeous, and who also played that bug-eating ghoul a minute ago. Mmm, beauty food. Helen is wonderfully aware of her husband's tendency to be an asshole. That's important, isn't it? What? To be right, everybody else to be wrong. Their chemistry is excellent. Probably because Marilyn Eastman was the real-life business and romantic partner of Carl Hardman, who played Harry Cooper and who was a producer of the film. In fact, Night of the Living Dead's production company, Image 10 Inc., was a sort of merger between the Leighton Image, which was Romero's commercial company, and Hardman Associates Inc., which was Carl Hardman and Marilyn Eastman's audio studio. True to the production's DIY nature, both Hardman and Eastman did the makeup effects for the zombies. Helen goes upstairs to scope out the scene. Helen, meet Barbara. She, uh, likes doilies, I guess. What? Don't look at me, Barbara. You're the one who's catatonic. Her brother was killed. Yeah, I guess you've got a point. Harry Cooper don't give a damn and tries to order Barbara around, but Ben puts him in his place fast. If you stay up here, you take orders from me! 
And that includes leaving the girl alone. Just as Romero didn't think the race of his main character mattered, he also didn't consider the way he wrote his female lead. I fell into the old trap of the damsel in distress. You know, she breaks her shoes, she breaks her heels, she falls, she does everything, and she winds up being catatonic and ineffectual all the way through the movie. He'd address this issue in his future work, especially Day of the Dead and the 1990 remake of Night, in which Patricia Tallman plays a much more kick-ass version of Barbara. They get the TV working and tune in for a newscast, which in real life would have been black and white just like this film. By 1968, almost every movie was made in color, but Romero and his crew could only afford black and white film stock. It worked out, though, and made the movie feel more realistic, since newsreels at the the time were still broadcast in black and white. The characters watch as the newsman breaks open the big one. It has been established that persons who have recently died have been returning to life and committing acts of murder. Almost an hour in, they learn for the first time they're dealing with the living dead. They also learn what's causing this whole situation, a space probe that went to Venus and was destroyed as it re-entered Earth's atmosphere. I feel like that's a little known fact, that in the OG zombie movie, the dead come back because of Venusian radiation. The space magic is all but confirmed as the cause by a scientist on TV being interviewed by director George Romero in a cameo. Damn, that guy was tall. I love that this was shot in front of the actual U.S. Capitol, guerrilla style no doubt. I also love this guy on TV who says people have to burn the bodies of their loved ones. They must be burned immediately. Soak them with gasoline and burn them. The bereaved will have to forego the dubious comforts that a funeral service will give. Uh, they're just dead flesh. That dude's not fucking around. Wanting to get help for the unconscious child in their cellar, the survivors make a plan to get to a rescue station mentioned on TV. Since the truck that Ben rolled in on is just about out of gas, they'll need to refuel it at a nearby pump. Harry tosses Molotov cocktails from the windows to scare the ghouls away, giving Ben and Tom an opening to get outside to the truck. Just be mindful of that stripper zombie! At the last minute, Judy runs outside to join the Jets, and as Ben plays defense with a toy, Porch, they drive the truck, slowly but surely, to a gas pump on the property that was previously established when Barbara first reached the farmhouse. The refueling mission gets sloppy in a hurry. Ben has to shoot the pump free when they can't unlock it, and Tom accidentally waters the truck like it were a gasoline chugging flower. A gasadil, perhaps. The fire spreads to the truck, and although Tom drives it safely away from the pump, Judy's jacket gets caught when they try to escape, so they're killed when the truck goes up in flames. One of my most told Old stories is how this kill upset me as a young child, and how my mom quote unquote comforted me by saying that when their burnt corpses were later eaten by zombies, it was kind of the same as when we humans eat fried chicken. She actually wasn't too far off from the truth. The zombie extras here are feasting on raw organs from the local butcher shop. Ben runs back to the house, but finds that he's been locked outside by the coward Harry Cooper. God damn, that self-resentment is just oozing out of his face. Oh man, Coop, when Ben gets in there, yeah, I don't even have to say it, huh? Ben doesn't either. He speaks with his fists, giving Cooper a few more bruises to join that shiner on his forehead. The tension in the farmhouse stays high as more and more zombies approach it. The only hope for survival is in the footage they see on TV, a sheriff's posse roaming the Pennsylvanian countryside trying to put down all these undead ghouls. Wait, this is a 3 a.m. broadcast. Why is it daylight in this footage. Anyway, this news report establishes a mainstay zombie rule. The ghoul can be killed by a shot in the head or a heavy blow to the skull. That shouldn't be too difficult, thankfully, given the zombies' speed and general messed upness. Are they slow moving, Chief? Yeah, they're dead. They're all messed up. That is one of my favorite line deliveries ever, courtesy of the sheriff's actor, George Cosana, who was also the film's production manager. His interviewer in this scene is real-life broadcaster Chili Billy Cardill, a native of nearby Sharon, Pennsylvania. The farmhouse's lights go out, and the zombies take this opportunity to attack. Through sheer numbers and tools, they start to break their way inside, and instead of helping Ben repel them, Harry grabs the gun so he can feel like a big man. 
This causes another fight between the two that ends with Ben straight up shooting Harry right in front of the man's wife. God damn, that's cold. Harry survives long enough to stumble into the cellar, but he dies as he makes his way over to his daughter's body. Since Helen's not quite ready for any of these suitors offering their hands in marriage, she flees into the cellar as well, where she finds her daughter Karen having died and come back as a zombie. She's eating Harry's arm right now because she's gotta have her pops. Karen, who now wants to give her mommy a hug, was played by 11-year-old Kira Stone, the real-life daughter of Carl Hardman, who played her dad. She also doubled as the zombie upstairs when it was dragged away by Ben. That's why it had more of a face in that scene. Karen grabs a nearby mason trowel and uses it to kill Helen, stabbing her mother over a dozen times in a row. This matricide is made all the more disturbing by the film's spacey use of sounds and screams. <laughs> And kids in 1968 were watching this shit? Nightmares for life, son! Upstairs, Barbara sees her old friend the cemetery zombie, and he's brought her bro Johnny along for a little sibling reunion. Barbara, sadly, and somewhat shockingly, is killed after she's dragged outside by her brother's reanimated corpse. Wasn't no final girl trope back then. The zombies break in and begin to surround Ben, and little Karen Cooper tries to give him a free pass to club zombie. He fends them off and gets into the cellar, ironically saving himself in the way he argued against this entire film. Although, actually, no. He said the cellar could be used as a backup, so Harry Cooper can still get fucked. Downstairs, Ben discovers quite the Cooper oopser. And since I'm counting zombie deaths, I'll count it when he kills Harry Cooper for a second time and Helen Cooper for the first, after both of them come back as the living dead. Ben takes a knee as the zombies have a tub thump and stomp around upstairs, and he waits it out until a film dissolve brings us mourning and some quiet. I guess zombie parties have curfews too. By the light of day, the human zombie hunters have gotten organized. They've got themselves a helicopter and a pack of good boys. Of course, these gun-toting guys could be considered good old boys, which is what gives this movie's ending that much more symbolic weight. Ben wakes up downstairs and hears the commotion outside. How could he miss all the gunshots going off as the posse kills six zombies shambling around? Man, counting zombies is gonna get real dangerous later. I can already tell. That's a future problem, though. A present problem is watching this fucking tragic ending. All right, Vince, hit him in the head, right between the eyes. It is an absolute punch to the gut that Ben gets mistaken for a zombie and killed. It makes me want to cry every time I have to see it. So depressing and nihilistic. Really fits the year this movie came out. The haunting finale portrays still photographs of Ben's body being disposed of. The hunters drag it out of the house with hooks and toss it onto a pyre alongside the corpse of the cemetery zombie, which is the final kill I'll count. There is no way not to see the resemblance to real life photos of lynchings in the US, showing once more that regardless of Romero's intentions, having a black man in the lead role highlighted our country's struggles with racism. A movie as multi-layered as this is great regardless of its kill count, but I've still got a duty to report a total to you, so hey, I'm coming to count you, numbers. By my count, there were 22 kills in Night of the Living Dead. Eight females, three of whom were zombies, and 14 males, 10 of whom were zombies. That's a lot of dead flesh baked into our pie chart. With a runtime of 96 minutes, that left us with a kill on average every 4.36 minutes. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to Helen Cooper. I can't imagine seeing this kill on the big screen in 1968. It must have been a real assault on the senses. Completely disturbing. I love it. Doll machete for lamest kill will go to Johnny. Even as a kid, I was like, wait, what the fuck? He's dead? And hey, maybe I should have done this before with other zombie movies but let's make a new award to highlight the best the undead has to offer. I'll give the inaugural Coolest Corpse Award for Best Zombie to the Cemetery Zombie. He's the first one we see, his jolting zombie movements are great, and he scores the first kill in the movie. It's like electing Washington as the first president. I kinda have to do it. Now? And that's it. Night of the Living Dead came out in 1968 and, due to a clerical error, wasn't properly copyrighted. Filmed under the esoteric title Night of Anubis, it was originally released as Night of the Flesh Eater. When they changed the name, the distributor failed to copyright the new title, so it fell into public domain, which sadly cost Romero millions in lost revenue. 
Its public domain status, however, did lead to its popularity, as anyone could screen or re-release it without paying royalties. It's also why you'll notice it on the TV and in the background of countless other movies. Seriously, you can't throw a stone in a video store without hitting a movie that uses it. Then again, you can't throw a stone in a video store at all. They don't exist anymore. I'll continue this series next week with the maltastic Dawn of the Dead. But until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. On the next Kill Count. Now that you know where zombies came from, let's have a little fun with them across the pond. <laughs> Sean is a Brit without purpose in his life. Sort your fucking life out, mate. He spends most of his time hanging with his farty friend, Ed. I'll stop doing it when you stop laughing. With their heavy schedule of video gaming and drinking at the pub, Sean's unable to find the time to be a good boyfriend. There for your mom, aren't they? Yeah. Lucky for him, he gets a second lease on his love life when the zombie apocalypse interrupts his hangover one morning. <laughs> hey, just get off me! Will Sean be able to rise to the occasion and keep his loved ones from being turned into the undead? <laughs> or will his big plan to save everyone amount to having a pint at the pub? It could be both, it could be neither. Fuck a doodle do. Find out this week by watching the classic zombie comedy, Shaun of the Dead. And on Sunday, tune in for the kill count on Dead Meat. Yeah, boy! Shaun of the Dead can currently be watched on the pictured streaming platforms. Dead Meat always recommends you watch the movie for yourself before it's kill count. It's the only way to have your own properly informed opinion. Kill counts are never meant to replace the experience of watching a film. Thanks a lot for watching this week's kill count. I want to thank some patrons like Kern Dolan, Dominic Cipolo, Chloe Scott, Garrison Rucker, Jonathan Cedarlund, and Sam Farmer. Big thanks to Chelsea for making these fake 2x4s to nail up, nail up against the set. That's right, before we do Dawn of the Dead, we're gonna do Shaun of the Dead, because some people on YouTube don't like old movies, so let's give them something a little newer. Also, Shaun of the Dead is just really fucking good. Thanks, everyone. Be good people.